give our respects to them and their cultures and elders both past and present. As you know, my name's Dan Cregan. To the right, joining us is the Honourable Reggie Martin, Mr Lucy Hood MP, Mr Michael Brown MP, Sarah Andrews MP. To my left, members of the Upper House, immediately before a member of the Lower House, the Honourable Sarah Game, or Rob Sims, Your Honourable Jing Lee, or John Gardner MP. The purpose of today's session is to allow the committee to ask additional questions in an open forum. It may, however, be necessary for certain evidence again to be taken in camera if the professors form the view that it is necessary for evidence to be taken in camera. Please indicate that prior to making any answer. It may be that you have opening statements once more. We wish to receive those statements briefly so that we can turn to questions from members. Perhaps to reverse the order, the University of Adelaide first when compared okay, to the last occasion. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have two very brief statements uh, which we would like to set the scene with. So first, I wish to thank the committee for having us back to answer questions that may have arisen since I last had the privilege to appear before you with my colleagues David Lloyd and our respective chancellors Pauline Carr and Catherine Branson, ACKC. The matter under consideration is weighty and of utmost importance. It pertains to the foundations that, in our view, are of fundamental importance to our securing a prosperous and socially cohesive future for the state of South Australia, namely a healthy and growing economy enabled by a strong education and innovation system. Benjamin Franklin is quoted as saying, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. We agree. Our state has benefited from such investment in the past, but there are good reasons to believe we must do more across the life course of individual citizens and secure a higher level of participation and attainment. Failure to do so will, in our view, not only be the wrong thing to do, but also diminish our future prosperity and attractiveness as a place to live, work, play and invest. Our domain of expertise is higher education, and we are proud that our two respective universities, after deep and long analysis, have concluded we can do more together than as separate and competing institutions in a relatively small economy. This ambition to do more as a university of scale and enhanced standing is captured in the vision we set out for the prospective new Adelaide University. And I quote, Australia's new four-purpose university is a leading contemporary comprehensive university of global standing. We're dedicated to ensuring the prosperity, well-being and cohesion of society by addressing educational inequality through our actions and through the success and impacts of our students, staff and alumni. Partnered with the communities we serve, we conduct outstanding future-making research of scale and focus. To attain the above vision and ambition will require a large co-investment over the next seven years. Our respective institutions have been well managed through COVID and are able to contribute very substantially to the formation of Adelaide University, but will be dependent on a comparable investment from our state. We do not so much see this as an expenditure item for South Australia. More precisely, it represents an opportunity to co-invest for even greater returns as we seek to strengthen one of the most fundamental pillars of success. As I said, educational attainment and knowledge-based transformation leading to sustainable growth. A project of this dimension is not without risk, but the track record of our institutions and the deep feasibility studies undertaken suggests it's a manageable risk. Conversely, the failure to grasp this opportunity is likely to pose a much bigger risk for South Australia and its future. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the committee uh, for this further opportunity to present and to address questions and let me also thank you for the time uh, and attention that you've all given to this initiative. I'm quite sure that in the future when those look back on the creation of the new university they'll have a very rich record of inquiry to explore. 
Now, having uh, observed the proceedings of this inquiry for the past three months or so, um, I have the following final opening remarks. Our universities are not being compelled to progress a merger. We've each determined that the creation of a new university is in our individual and collective best interests. Under our existing legislation, our councils have interrogated the pros and cons of progression, the risks, the costs, the benefits associated, and they've each independently determined that this is the correct course of action, preferable to the status quo and with significant benefit if executed to time and budget. We have confidence in our ability to deliver the new institution. The transition plan that was agreed by the institutions has been thoroughly investigated. The risks therein are manageable, the costs are realistic and well understood. We have absolute confidence in our management and in the, in the staff of our institutions to realise the benefits of the new Adelaide University. We have acted to provide clarity and certainty of employment to this grouping. We have clarity of purpose and have shared vision. We have unparalleled opportunity for South Australia to have, and future generations of South Australians, to have a truly nation-leading, world-class, comprehensive university. Over the last several months, uh, we've provided some fulsome information, both in public and in camera, to validate our assumptions, our costings, our timeline, our risk profile and its mitigation. Though often tempted, we have not sought to discredit some of the contrary and tangential opinions which have been presented by others to this committee, even when they have been advanced from a position of ignorance of the facts, lack of knowledge of the complexities of higher education management and operations, or from a speculative viewpoint of self-interest devoid of substantive evidence. Uninformed opinion has been advanced on a range of topics, from timing to costs, risks, student experience and curriculum standards, none of which have any basis in fact, as demonstrated by our institution's clear evidence on such matters to this group. The University of South Australia and the University of Adelaide are autonomous bodies corporate established by legislation. They're proud and experienced institutions that collectively have the wherewithal to progress all elements of the creation of the new university, save one aspect the passage of the legislation which is necessary to create a compelling and new institution of enviable benefits to the state. We are not operating in any political domain on this topic, nor do we wish this opportunity to be politicised in any way. Our sole intent is to advance the prospects for higher education for future generations of students and researchers to the creation of the new institution that our councils have endorsed. In that regard, we're grateful for the modest and measured financial support that's been advanced by the state government to assist us to further de-risk our undertaking. I request now the legislator of uh, South Australia, of our parliamentarians, our elected representatives, is to act on this new and unique opportunity and to resolve to engage with us and to support us as partners and as founders of this new University for South Australia. Thank you. Thank you, professors. Also joining us by video conference is the Honourable Connie Benares. If I can ask the first question, is it possible for you both to briefly outline the risks of taking no action? The committee has heard extensive evidence in relation to the potential benefits of the merger and also some, but perhaps not far from all, of the risks. But I wonder what is, in your concise view, the risk of taking no action now? So maybe I can start. Uh, first of all, there is the opportunity risk, uh, which is to not deliver on the upsides uh, that we have convinced ourselves exist. Uh, second, um, in the Australian university system, uh, universities are finding it increasingly difficult to afford to do everything they need to do. You need scale to do that, so you can amortise many of your running costs uh, across um, uh, a larger revenue. So individually, uh, our revenues uh, will be in the order of one billion per annum and seven hundred million per annum combined. We will have a revenue on one point seven billion, uh, and that does mean that the cost of running the university uh, per capita will be reduced and there will be more money left for the academic purpose. Conversely, if costs continue to increase, and uh, today is, is, is a good example of cost uh, uh, be, uh, increases being felt by all in our society, uh, we will be able, we will have to, as we did during COVID, 
to reduce our staff complement to actually not run in the red. Now, what does it mean when you run in the red? It means that you are obliged to address the areas which put you into the red. And if we were to do that, we would have to put at risk some disciplines and research areas which we believe South Australia needs to have. There are lots of things that are at risk because student demand is not necessarily reflecting the desire for the state to keep a discipline alive. When will that really play out? That would play out, for example, if the thing that keeps many universities financially alive, namely international student revenue, was to decline, as we saw during COVID. Indeed, when we look at uh, the annual report uh, for about, from memory, 37 universities that reported last year, and you abstract out investment returns or losses, only 14 of those universities ran a surplus. So if the state in the long term wants to have a university of sufficient scale to be able to offer across all the disciplines that are necessary to run a civil society, we need to have a bigger scale than we would have absent uh, the student body that, uh, uh, that wouldn't be big, uh, big enough. So that's a real downside risk. The, uh, the other downside risk is that, uh, of, of not going ahead, is that we as a population in South Australia is in relative terms becoming smaller uh, than our uh, sister and brother universities in the Eastern States. And in our funding system, the, the prominence and what we can do and therefore our national and global reputation is dependent on being bigger. If our reputation and our ability to, uh, to, to uh, offer what students want is diminished, we will see a greater proportion in our view of very able South Australians decide to get educated, uh, uh, particularly in the Eastern States. And once they go there, it's very hard to get them back. So that will be a downside for us. Yeah. Um, I'd echo Peter's uh, concerns about the risk to comprehensiveness in our institutions and the sustainability of our institutions and not progressing. Um, and also his, um, his, his point about the retention of the best and brightest of our young people here in the state as we're trying to uh, ensure we, we can stem a brain drain uh, to other jurisdictions. There are 39 public universities in Australia and you can rank them from 1 to 39. If we're lucky and other jurisdictions do not act to strengthen their higher education institutions, if we don't progress, South Australia may have a top 10 national institution in, in the state. Uh, if we do progress, we'll have a top five. And that's a competitive advantage that we should take. I'm Rob Sims. Thanks um, very much, Vice Chancellors, for coming along today and making yourselves available. I should explain, you may have dealt with my colleague Tammy Franks previously. She was um, the Greens representative on this committee while I was on leave overseas. Um, and now I'm back, I've, I've stepped onto the committee. So good to have an opportunity to, to ask you both some questions. Um, I did want to ask you a few questions about an article that's in, in Daily today regarding concerns around potential conflict of interest and the involvement of uh, Deloitte. Um, with respect in particular, I think, to the University of Adelaide and for you, um, Professor Hoy. Um, is it the case that a, a member of um, or a, a, um, a staff member of Deloitte is on the University Council? And did they recuse themselves from the discussions regarding um, a potential merger, given they've now been, I understand, awarded the contract to oversee the merger process? Is that that happens. Are you able to talk a little bit about how potential conflict of interest is managed at the university council level? Yes. Yeah, so, um, first of all, um, the uh, person in question is no longer a member of the University of Adelaide Council, uh, as all uh, properly run governing bodies do. Uh, they are always start a meeting where people are asked whether they have anything to add to the known 
interest that they have, their known conflicts of interest, and they're asked to um, either uh, always indicate if something comes up in discussion where they realise they have a conflict of interest. So that happens at, at all times. So uh, in discussions uh, about any matter, uh, a person uh, of proper standing and the person in question uh, is of uh, very proper standing would have uh, recused themselves from a, any decision making in respect of that. Um, so they did in relation to this matter? Sorry? So, so they recuse themselves in relation to this matter? Uh, I don't know what you mean by recuse. Well, but they, they remove themselves or, or they, they still participated but disclosed the conflict to them. Uh, I, think, I think what would be useful before we continue that line, uh, line of questioning is perhaps for um, uh, Professor Lloyd to tell you uh, how this uh, took part. But in terms of... Um, I'm happy to tell you. Yeah, so I just want to make one point. Uh, in terms of, of, of whether the universities had foreshadowed that in order to bring about a very complex <coughs> integration of two very large complex institutions uh, in our feasibility studies and transition plan, it was always clear that we would not be able to do this on our own and we would have to identify an integration partner. And quite frankly, if that had not been part of our thinking, uh, people would have asked us, what are you thinking about? But maybe I can, I, I can ask David to expand on my answers. So um, first of all, it should be recorded that the institutions have jointly procured the, serv the services of Deloitte. It's not a single procurement by one institution. It's a joint contract with the two. And it relates to the heads of agreement between the two, the two institutions to enable the progression for the creation of a new institution. Um, in the preparation of the transition plan, as Peter alluded, it was made very clear that an integration management partner was going to be required due, due to the complexity of the undertaking. Uh, the institutions on uh, passage of the resolution to progress the creation of the institution with the support from the government in July began a process to uh, secure that through a, uh, an invited tender process. There were 13 participants in that process. Um, the process was completely independent of the council, so it was run by the management. We had an independent probate advisor and an independent procurement advisor uh, who were contracted by the institutions. And to the best of my knowledge, over 4,500 hours of evaluation was conducted by over 20 staff, all independent of the councils. There were two members of councils on the approval body, neither of which are the individual in case. In, in, in case. They made a recommendation to Peter and to myself as the chief executives of the two organisations that procure a service. So, so you're both satisfied that the conflict of interest process that you have in place was followed in, in this instance? In total. Okay. And look, I do have another question for you. Um, we've had some evidence to this committee around the issue of uh, capping vice-chancellor's salaries. And I'm sorry to ask you both about financial matters. I was always told it's, it's rude to ask people about uh, their salaries, so I apologise for that. But it is relevant, um, I think, in terms of the considerations of the committee. Are you able to clarify for us the precise nature of your salary packages? I, I did have a look through um, the annual reports just to try and get my head around that. And if my reading is correct, um, you both had a, an increase over the 2021 to 2022 period. That's according to the... The annual report. I think Professor Lloyd, you had a, an increase of approximately a bit, bit over 200,000 um, over that period, and Professor Ho, 100,000. Are you able to just clarify the, the exact nature of your packages? So I can speak for myself. So obviously, both institutions are publicly audited, and um, the, the details of what the auditors deem to be our remuneration. Uh, in the respective years you're referring to, which must be 2021 and 2022, uh, are listed for you to see. Uh, in respect of myself, I can't speak about David. Uh, I didn't work a full year in 2021. So your conclusion that my sa annual salary went up by the stated amount is erroneous. And from memory in that period, reporting period, I think my salary from February uh, uh, 2021 uh, till um, sometime in 2023 went up by 2%, less money than my staff. 
and Professor yeah. Lloyd. Um, so my remuneration did increase in 2022. It was as a result of a deferred bonus, which was a bonus which was paid off to retain me in the three years previous. My base salary hasn't been increased by that quantity. So the additional payment there was a bonus that, okay. And so that, as reported in the, the annual report, that's the full amount. And there's a, yeah, that is the full amount. Um, and it's, the bonus is clarified in the, in the annual statements as well. Thank you very much. Is, is, do you, either of you have a view on the issue of um, caps of vice chancellor's salaries or executive salaries? It is an issue that um, Mr Schott uh, raised with us when he um, spoke at the committee. Well, to be fair to him, I think I put it to him. <laughs> he did um, comment on it. Do you have a view on, on that and whether that's something that should be looked at as part of the new structure? Um, I can tell you that we don't set our salaries. Um, they're set on a competitive basis. And I did refer to the 39 institutions with which we compete for talent. Um, and you can find the comparable salaries at all vice chancellor levels in Australia. I have nothing to add to that. It's a matter for the remuneration and nominations committees of the institutions. Uh, but clearly, uh, I find myself in a very fortunate uh, situation to be paid very, very well. Can I ask you just a few questions about the University of Adelaide's um, ranking, uh, Professor Hoy? Um, it's dropped uh, 23 places in the, um, the latest uh, Times Higher Education list. I do understand that's happened to a number of institutions in Australia at the moment, so um, I certainly recognise that. This committee has heard some evidence that there's a, a risk that when the new, or if the new university is constituted, that there could be a dip in, in rankings. Is that something that concerns you, given we'd be coming off potentially a lower base? So uh, there are a couple of points I have to make here. Uh, first of all, uh, that uh, dropping ranking uh, for University of Adelaide was shared amongst all, I think, group of eight universities. Except that. Although Australia. Adelaide did go further yeah, no, back, no, I think. Uh, uh, it follows uh, a very large increase in our rankings the year before. And th this drop was due primarily to a change in methodology <coughs> for the calculations. The important thing is to say, what was the ranking in 2022, uh, as opposed to this new ranking, which is deemed to be a 2024 ranking? It was exactly 111, as it is now. So it's a method change that uh, led to the drop. And if you go back four years and look at the place in the Times Higher Education ranking four years ago, and now there are only two G of eight universities that have a better ranking now than we had four years, and it's University of Adelaide, because we were 118 four years ago, and it's Monash University. So these things flux and wane. However, it is quite clear, and this is one thing that we have said, that at our current scale, we cannot stably hope to be in the top 100 on a permanent basis. We need scale to do that. We need scale to get more free cash flow from the efficiencies that come to invest a greater proportion of our revenue in the academic purpose, which is education and research. And I should just say, we also managed to get up uh, from a position of about 108 in the QS rankings in 2022 to 89 uh, this year. So it's, it's, it's a very strong university, but is, it will always be at the best, in my view, at the cost of top 100 because of its relatively small size. Yeah, um, just the... the the intricacies of rankings are somewhat Byzantine in terms of the way they operate. Um, the corollary to the drop in Adelaide's performance this year was an increase in the University of South Australia's performance by about 30 places. So there's a swings and roundabouts component which levels out over time. The objective of integration in the institution is to have a university which will be sustainably ranked in the top 1% of universities globally. We haven't said we want to have a top 100 university. We said we want to be in the top 1% of, of universities globally. And that really equates to a, a sustainable top 100 position. There's no way that our institutions can do that without the measures we're going to undertake unless a significant amount of resources provided to, to one or other of us. UniSA is not going to go from 300 to the top 100 overnight by any means. And in fact, it will take a number of decades before that happens. 
in the way in which we've approached rankings and ranking strategy. We have commissioned rankings uh, input from the QS and the Times Higher rankings agencies, and we have got data to demonstrate what the provisional ranking of the future institution will be based on its 2022 performance. And based on the 2022 performance, the new university, if deemed to be a new institution, which it will be by dint of legislation, will be ranked inside the top 100. And just one final question, so I know my colleagues will have questions for you as well. Uh, there's been some um, a number of claims made uh, about jobs, and, and in particular, um, I know the Deputy Premier has said that there will be no forced redundancies in the initial period. Can you clarify um, for us how long that initial period is, and how can staff be assured that there won't be any job cuts, given by the very nature of bringing two organisations together, there's bound to be some reduction um, in staffing levels? We've given an unconditional guarantee to our staff in writing from us and from our councils, which was delivered on the day of the passage of the resolutions of the institutions, that until the before the creation of the new institution and for the first 18 months thereafter, which is a four-year window on our estimation post-2020, uh, post between now and uh, 2026 and on into the middle of 2027, there'll be no compulsory redundancies. That's our assurance, and as long as we're in charge, sort of an act majeure which we cannot control, there will be no force redundancies. So that's just that initial period, though? That's four years. For four years, and then after that, it's go for I'd gold. I'd love to see an organisation give certainty outside a four-year window on this on its staffing profile. Um, we do not have a secret plan to make people redundancy on, on day one of year five. Our ambition is to grow. Uh, the revenue of the institution and for those who were fortunate enough to read our feasibility study, um, we uh, are planning to have about 1,200 employees more by 2034 than we have upon the formation of the university. We should say that, um, of course, um, there, there, there will always be people who, for one reason or other, change the employer. Uh, they might get better opportunities, they might have to go somewhere else in the country or even internationally to look after ageing parents. What we're saying is, as a consequence of the merger, we will not have any forced redundancies before uh, July 2024 at the earliest and 26, yeah, 27, sorry, <laughs> correction, 27, July 27, and we have not planned for it. Okay. Thanks, Vice Chancellor. Honourable Sarah Gann. Thank you uh, very much. Um, you said in your opening statement, and I agree, that the government's put in um, a measured and mo modest investment. And I think that's been very misleading the way that's been presented and reported. I'm not saying that's been sort of deliberate, but one of the ba battles I've got is trying to explain to people why the government's investing so heavily um, in the universities when in fact it's, it's not. Um, you know, it's going to buy some land, it might make money off that land, it's investing in research and development really, which could benefit the wider community. Uh, and hopefully investing in, as you say, sending more uh, low socioeconomic and rural students going to university. So I guess my question is, what, what else does the government need to do? So we, the, the, the goal is to have this thriving entrepreneurial university. As you know from our discussions, I'm interested primarily in how this is going to benefit the wider economy and lift wages. So if the university can do its part, what else does the government need to do to ensure this this successful combination? Um, so maybe I can start. I saw David was just making some notes. So one of the aspirations we have is for the educational attainment of South Australia to uh, be at least on par with the rest of the country. Um, we are told by those who look into uh, future jobs creation that nine out of 10 jobs will require a post-year 12 education. So if we want uh, prosperity uh, uh, for the vast majority of our South Australian citizens, we actually need to make sure that they even get to year 12. So I think one of the things the government really has to think about is that if the aspirations uh, is for more people to get a post-year 12 education, 
how do we actually make sure that people, uh, that children, from the day they're born till they get to primary school and then get through primary school and high school, uh, will uh, be able to get through and have aspiration to do more. I think this is where the state can make an enormous difference. I will try to uh, exemplify this. We often have long discussions at our university about why we don't have more Indigenous graduates. And part of the reason is that there is too small a proportion of Indigenous students who actually make it through to finish year 12. So I think what the state has to do is in the first instance to create swim lanes for very able students who otherwise would not get through the system because they're not getting the attention they need when they clearly have the potential. So I think at that level, the ambition to grow the university is dependent on what happens from cradle to at least year 12. Um, I'm really glad you asked the question because uh, even today in the same um, in daily uh, article which is referenced about the, the conflict of interest matter, there's an assertion that there's $444.5 million being given to us to deliver this institution. Um, the reality is that that is not the case. The direct costs of contributions in terms of the delivery of this institution, we've, over the next 10 years, we'll spend about $600 million in the, in the transformation of this institution from the two existing universities to the new university. And we sought support from government to, to offset about a half of that cost directly. What we're going to see in direct costs in terms of direct cash over that 10 year period is a $30 million investment fund to support international students. The transaction to secure uh, the surplus lands at Moss and Lakes, which we wouldn't ordinarily have been able to transact, so I see that as a contribution to the institutions for about $52 million. And the creation of a fund that if it returns a dividend, and if it performs the way the funds that we invest ourselves uh, perform, it might yield about $12 million a year for the next decade, so about $120 million in real costs. So when I add that up, that's about $202 million over 10 years, or $20 million a year. So that's the enabling investment which we're being delivered, or being, being which we secured to deliver a new institution. What we require government to do is to not dilute that any further, because it'll only go some way to directing our, 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 our uh, and offsetting our direct costs, but also to be an enabler, to be an enabler to allow us to place our students in the uh, in in the industries and in the operations and um, structures of government in the public service around our doctors, our nurses, our pharmacists, our teachers. Because all of those services that are going to support South Australia into the future are going to come from this institution. We produced the majority of every single one of those professions in this state. And we need the government to be an enabler. This is not a, an insignificant investment by government. It certainly is the biggest investment that, is, that our state government will have made in the history of higher education. But it's not a comparably huge investment compared to other jurisdictions. I think Peter will be able to talk about the, the billions that were put in in Queensland. Uh, in, in, in direct support of higher education. So what we ask is twofold. Don't dilute the packages on the table. Don't overinflate or misrepresent, re, misrepresent the packages on the table and enable us through legislation. And um, if I can act, uh, add to that, um, we see the educational infrastructure of our state as one of the absolute most important pieces of infrastructure that we must invest in. And we understand the importance of infrastructure. Uh, we contrast, for example, um, the 200 or so million dollars that David is talking about over 10 years uh, with the investment that is deemed uh, necessary to build 10, 15 kilometer of road, uh, where perhaps a metre of road will cost $1 million. Uh, and we would say that an education will last much longer than it will take for us to realise we had to re that road. Thank you. And um, 
I don't want to sort of be too repetitive because I know this has been brought up before, but I, I'm still not clear on um, explaining. Obviously, there's a general consensus um, that larger universities produce poor student experience. We did discuss that there are exceptions to that, but just clearly, um, how are you mitigating um, you know, that problem with this new merged university? So maybe I can start because I, I ran one of the largest universities uh, uh, in Australia, University of Queensland, uh, over eight years, and the student experience there is very, very good. You actually have, it's student experience is not a matter of size, it's a matter of how you reward your staff and tell them that even though the global rankings don't accord sufficient weight to student experience, we morally have to do it. So we're going to do it by investing what is required to be invested per student uh, in it. So it's not a matter of size, it's a matter of whether you reward people for enhancing the student experience as opposed to disproportionately rewarding a research output. But we often in society make important what is easy to measure rather than learning to measure what is really important. And I think uh, any objective observer would say that uh, people are chasing rankings uh, and they're chasing what the rankings are measuring rather than what they should be measuring. So uh, we need to stay strong and say, we know that one day, not only is it right to improve the student experience, but it will also be to our benefit if we get ahead of that game. And the University of Queensland has shown it's possible. Um, we're on record in, in doing the comparative analysis of which institutions nationally have higher or lower um, student experiences. And we know that the two lowest ranked institutions for student experience are actually two very small institutions. So there's the correlation between size and, and, and experience is, is tentative. Um, I'll just put out there that UniSA is not a small university and we have a very, very highly ranked student <coughs> experience. And that's by design. And we're sitting down to design in a really excellent student experience in this new institution. It is not in our interests to have a disenfranchised student body through this transition. We'll be doing everything we can to make sure that their curriculum, their services, the experience, the classroom, everything is going to be uh, second to none. We've, we've set ourselves a target of having a top five student experience in the country. Just got two quick questions. And um, just on that, I guess, you're, you're, I, I, mean, I understand uh, the idea of rewarding staff for creating a good student experience, that's clear. In terms of, you know, you can have a good idea, um, but if you don't get people behind you, um, you know, it's often not successful. And I can tell you I'm still being, you know, contacted now by people who, you know, staff who are really unhappy with the merger. How are you going to get everyone or at least enough people on side uh, to execute this, this vision? Um, I can tell you that one of the steps we took was uh, last Friday, for the first time in the history of our two institutions, we brought 150 staff together and we sat them down and we asked them about the culture and attributes of the institution and about their ambitions and goals for the future. It's the beginning of a co-creation process to de deliver the strategy of the institution. And Peter and I, um, we kind of set the scene and then we stepped back to let the staff do work on, on various activities during the course of that day. Um, it's going to be, I mean, I know I talked about subjective inputs to this, to, to this uh, uh, committee, but I'll give you a subjective input. As we stood on the fringes looking in, we couldn't tell which staff were working for which institution. They were all wholeheartedly engaged in the creation of the new. We've surveyed over 240,000 people uh, in, the, in the formation of this institution. We spoke directly to over 3,000 people in town halls. And there's a, there's, a, there's a distribution, which is what you'd expect to see, is a normal distribution. There are some people who don't like it, and they're vocal. There are some people who think it's the best thing since, since sliced bread, and they're vocal. And in the middle, there's a whole group who are optimistic, enthusiastic, and are committed to the delivery of a new institution. We don't see the sense that you're seeing. So um, just to add to that, um, we honestly do not see uh, many staff being against what we're trying to achieve. We see some staff who um, are already doing a good job 
and knowing that the transition we are going into will require additional effort and they fear that we will not be able to resource that additional effort. We have said to them, uh, we have budgeted for resourcing that. So um, I, I look at the people who have decided to uh, make themselves available uh, to this committee and um, I'm, I'm surprised that you wouldn't have had an avalanche of people all making themselves available for this committee uh, if uh, there were such a groundswell against what we're trying to do. Uh, we don't see it. Obviously, at times, uh, people don't get to talk to us. Uh, but the survey that, that David um, uh, talked about was one that went to uh, in the order of 250,000 people, and I think we got 803 responses, and um, about 81% of the responses that they're about were neutral. Um, I think one of the things which has catalyzed some vocal uh, feedback has been some speculation about standards and ATARs. I think there was evidence given to the, co to the committee about um, the potential for a calamitous drop in the standards of the institution because in some way that you've got some combination of institutions which will just bring about that, that um, uh, drop in, in, in standards even though we're obliged to meet Australian qualification standards and the procurement and sorry the, the, the prescription of accrediting bodies. Just so the committee is aware, 70% of the students in our institution are not admitted on the base of ATAR. 30% is the primary admission basis on the other. So, so, and in that, ATAR is typically applied to the ones where you've got cutoffs like medicine or pharmacy or dentistry or radiation oncology, those elements where you actually have a prescribed number of students. Um, somebody very wise once said to me, the only uh, predictor of how you go at university is how you go at university. Thank you, and I, I really agree with that. I've just got one last question, which is, um, you stated that uh, the merged university will allow there to be more money for the um, academic purpose rather than the administrative purpose. And I just wanted you to, I know some of it is uh, already in various documents, but just to um, reiterate your commitment in terms of that extra money that will ultimately be available for the academic purpose, how that is going to uh, benefit people in rural and regional communities to increase their access to education and, in fact, perhaps be educated in their communities and stay in their communities? Yeah. So, uh, again, David is, is writing there, so I'll just start. Uh, we have uh, a presence, obviously, at the University of Adelaide at, Rose, uh, at Roseworthy, uh, and uh, there we have, uh, for instance, a veterinary science school, and I know you know a lot about veterinary uh, medicine. Um, if you run a veterinary school uh, under current funding conditions, it is virtually impossible to run a school like that on less than a $3 million loss per annum. Uh, <coughs> and scale will allow us to be able to afford to do that until one day, hopefully, the federal government will, will fund veterinary schools. So um, that that is one illustration of how you can keep things alive. Secondly, of course, and David can talk about that, uh, we're very fortunate to also have a presence uh, through UniSA at Mount Gambia and Wyala. Again, the, the scale, everything else being equal, will secure the long-term tenure of those uh, 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 facilities and it will enhance what we can put into them. But David, you might want to talk. I think um, certainly to the lens of the University of South Australia, there's been the greatest amount of fear articulated that the new institution would be less connected to regions, largely because of the, the naming of the institution. Uh, in the drafting of the Act, which is going to come before the House, we've been very clear about the commitment and obligations of the institution to connect to the regions. Um, UniSA has been engaged in Wyala and Gambia, certainly in Wyala, for over 50 years before the SAIT was up there for a long time. We now have presences in um, Seduna, in uh, Port Lincoln, in the AP Wylands. 
And those activities, those hubs, are part of our commitment to regional South Australia. I don't expect that to diminish one jot in terms of both our obligations and the functions of the institution. The availability of resource to sustain what, as Peter has outlined, are, are essentially loss-making activities is critical. The, the populations which participate in higher education in the regions are very small, and they don't allow the full breadth of, of, of you like, a, 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 full, a full comprehensive delivery of every program in the region. What we're doing with the new um, curriculum is constructing it in a way that even greater offerings, greater numbers of offerings will be able to be made available in the regions. So we think we'll see greater, uh, greater participation and retention of, of, of learners, um, largely doing um, remote activities, but also connected them through the nature of hubs. <coughs> and we've just seen the release of uh, initiatives from the federal government to deliver both uh, metropolitan study hubs and regional study hubs. And uh, we're, it's our ambition to, to make use of that program to actually strengthen and like, augment what we do. And, and, and finally, we obviously both run philanthropic programs and uh, we will continue to try to get people who have been fortunate in life to give philanthropically uh, to establish scholarships for able students who otherwise couldn't come. Something I have exemplified when I was at UniSA giving, uh, when I was much younger, $100,000 to get rural students to relocate uh, to, South, uh, to Adelaide because that was a barrier for them. Uh, just the first six, $7,000 to establish themselves. And of course, uh, in the proposed uh, arrangement with the state government, there is going to be a $100 million fund uh, which is going to uh, assist uh, financially underprivileged students to be able to uh, attain um, a, un uh, a university education. So that there's just some of the uh, components uh, going towards that. Thank you. As was you could. Thank you. Uh, yes, you alluded to it a little bit earlier, but it was just a question around that idea of ATARs because we had two academics um, and summarising here, but suggest that somehow by merging the two universities, you would have students with uh, ATARs in the 90s um, studying alongside students uh, in, with ATARs of 50. Um, I actually found some of one of the academics' comments quite offensive <laughs> as a former um, uh, alumni of UniSA, but can you just address um, some of those claims? I found it equally offensive. Um, I think, as I said, there's no... There's no predictor of how you're going to deliver in terms of we, we want to be able to provide education, access to education to anybody with the potential for success. And we're going to layer in the, the, the measures to, to see them uh, to be successful graduates and, or exit the institution successfully with skills and awards at every level of, of the new curriculum. Not everybody should go to university. We don't throw open the doors to universities and just say, come on in. The idea that you engage to attain a profession, the entry requirements are set by the institution. An ATAR is a variable rank which changes year on year. So somebody's ATAR of 50 this year is different to somebody's ATAR of 50 next year, depending on the cohort of students who've done the exam in that given year. It shouldn't be a determinant of, of overall um, you know, predictor of success. The, the variability of the, the potential learner is a fact of life. Right? And we are committed to, to widening participation in education through this institution. And we will put in place the, the means, the prerequisites, the supports to ensure that students who can succeed do succeed. And I, I would like to add to that, there's a difference between um, having a broad range of ATAR through which you enter university from saying that somebody will graduate to a different standard. What one always has to be concerned about is, is there a relaxation of the standard to which you grade people? And there won't be, but there will for some students be uh, a need to be offered additional uh, access to learning if they come from, for example, a school that doesn't uh, offer specialist maths. It's very hard to think that you could um, uh, not benefit from having specialist math if you were to build uh, a new Sydney Harbour Bridge. So oh, what we're you. doing Jeez. at University 
of Adelaide is for those students, we're offering them an opportunity to pick up those math skills Thanks. in year one, where somebody who comes with them maybe can take an elective and not do it. So, but they will both, irrespective of what background they came in with, in my view, be able to build a new Sydney Harbour Bridge when they graduate. But the journey through the system would have been slightly different. Just on supplementary to the comments, particularly from uh, the member and Professor Lloyd, um, the government's got an election policy to require teaching graduates, free teaching students, to have an ATAR minimum of about 70. Uh, and they were going to work with the universities to uh, ensure that was the case. I wonder, firstly, if you care to reflect on whether that's also offensive, but also uh, perhaps more seriously, if the university is um, looking at minimum ATARs for any so courses. In that specific case, um, the education programs have capped numbers because of placements. So an ATAR is an appropriate measure, one appropriate measure for determination of entry. And the uh, minimum ATAR for, for the, the programs in, in, in uh, consideration of that scheme, the University of South Australia is already in excess of that. And that's based on the cap at the moment yeah. and has been for a number of years, as I understand. So a minimum ATAR of 70 is redundant because you're already above it? Um, the ATAR is already higher than that. Thank you. I've got more questions, but if there were others, I'll turn to you no, for more answer. Thank you. Um, in relation, I've got a couple of questions on a couple of different topics. In relation to infrastructure, one of the uh, topics that's been discussed and um, on which uh, we as a committee have been challenged to consider uh, is whether or not the costings provided to us are reliable. Now, obviously, some of this is in the domain of information you provided to us in camera, so I'll be very careful to, uh, not to go too direct. But um, one of the... Uh, we've had a couple of people give us evidence in relation to the Manchester merger that you'd be more than uh, adequately familiar with in terms of the costs, unexpected costs, apparently, of the infrastructure investment. There were... Uh, um, I think there's evidence we've had that there were infrastructure works that had to uh, be done to enlarge spaces to enable more students to be fitted in. The evidence that you gave us, I think, in uh, your questions on notice was that uh, the universities do not anticipate major capital works as part of the transition. A capital works program will be developed once Adelaide University is created and the opportunity to rationalise the programs of two universities into one, achieving more impact and utility for lower cost. If I can summarise, as I understand it, there's a very small, modest, I think, uh, uh, program of infrastructure that is anticipated will be needed, but it won't be based on the requirement to enlarge lecture theatres or, or, or labs or anything like that. Can you give us any more information about what plans you have in relation to infrastructure that gives you confidence that only that modest uh, investment might be needed in the, in the short to medium term? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the key piece in this is the consideration that on day one of formation, we're not going to have more students than we currently have right now. So if you come in, we, and we can currently accommodate those students pretty well within the infrastructure we have across the two institutions. The new timetable, the new curriculum, will enable us to actually utilise the assets we have to, to a greater and more efficient way. And that's the, the, the reference to rationalisation is not about the removal of things, it's about the streamlining of the way in which we operate. We do not require investment in significant, um, if you like, teaching infrastructure in terms of cap, uh, lecture theatres. We have ample capacity across the two organisations to deliver what needs to be done by the modality by which we will deliver those uh, courses and the frequency by which um, courses will be scheduled in the new timetable and the flexibility will afford our students. The Manchester um, information which has been presented has kind of oscillated around that, that, that in, in every presentation it's got more and more expensive. Uh, we have been in direct communication with the Vice Chancellor of the University of Manchester. I think Peter might want to just give a, a feedback on, 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 the, on what we have learned in that correspondence with, with people who were on the ground and actually did the doing. No, I, 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 I can't do that at this point in time, other than to say that the infrastructure plan for University of Manchester, as I understand it, was an ambition to transform that university. It wasn't a direct merger cost. In our case, we, of course, as universities, 
have a normal percentage of our revenue set aside for infrastructure. Uh, many of you will have noticed that in the last decade, uh, there have been two buildings built on North Terrace, the Health Sciences Buildings for University of Adelaide, the Health Sciences Building uh, for University of South Australia, and uh, the average price of those two, and they were very close to each other, uh, would have been about $250 million each. And both universities are debt free. So in our normal business of running universities, we are investing tens of millions of dollars in infrastructure. That will not go away. What we're saying is that there is not an additional massive infrastructure investment required over and above that. So let me just illustrate the, the magnitude of what universities do. Some of you will know about Union House at University of Adelaide. Some of you might even have spent some time there. And we have now started a program, which is running now, to refurbish Union House. And that costs $38 million. And we're doing that now, out of our normal cash flow. If you run a university where there's no cash flow set aside each year that matches de depreciation costs, which is about 2.8%, 2, 2 so let's just say 3%, 3% out of a revenue of $1.8 billion is 50 more million per annum. Of course, we'll put lots of money into infrastructure. What we're saying is we don't need to make additional call on infrastructure investments to bring about this merger. Uh, quite seriously, we will have better utilisation of our space if there were a lecture theatre required, uh, uh, say, at University of South Australia, and they were a bit short on it, there's every chance that at that same time there would be one free at University of Adelaide and vice versa. So um, uh, respectfully, uh, I would say that the cohort of people that have been peddling that uh, might simply just want to live and retain a past that in our view is not optimal for South Australia. Um, does Chair, can I ask a supplementary on that when the Honourable Mr Gardner's finished, please? Yes, now would be a good time. The right, right, sure. Thank you. Just just by way of supplementary, I apologise to jump in there, um, but just by way of supplementary and picking up on that last point that was made, um, and I say this respectfully, but we've listened to the arguments about Manchester, we've listened to the arguments about Accord, um, and we have heard from um, some staff um, academia, academia who simply don't want, for whatever reason, to embrace this change. Um, and again, I say this respectfully, if we are going to take the universities into the future, is it fair to say this isn't a new concept that we've just come up with overnight? Um, the universities have been talking about this now for some years, we all know that, um, and this is the most scrutinised and tested model um, and we don't have another two years or one year to wait to, to, to go over the same ground that you've been going over for however many years now. You've done the legwork. There may be just some academ um, academics uh, and staff who simply do not agree uh, that this is the way to take the universities into the future. Um, I think it's fair to say that in my 11 years of uh, being a vice chancellor at the University of South Australia, I've never taken a decision that 100% of people have liked. Um, and uh, this would be no different. Uh, what we have done is a really thorough investigation of what's in the best interest of the institution in the state. We've interrogated it to the best of our ability with support from external agencies. We presented that internally to you in, in camera, so the data is all there. And no amount of reinterrogation will, will change that information. Um, and no amount of, of us saying it's right will convince somebody who thinks it's wrong that it's not that it's right. It's going to be a, a, a matter of opinion. Uh, I, I believe that we're pretty well placed to advance a case that this is well thought through, measured, and while it has risk, the risks have been mitigated, and with the level of investment which is on the table, neither of us have experienced a, a cost blowout in the collective 27 years of operating of institutions that we have under our belt, um, and we don't have to start now. Thank you. 
Can and, I and just, just by way of just second supplementary, and then I'll, I'll hand back to Mr. Gardner. But um, I think the the other group that we've failed to acknowledge in this today is the students um, who we've talked uh, around, um, but obviously are critical in this component when it comes to what's best in terms of their futures. Now, we've got two student unions who have said, subject to some changes uh, that you've already committed to on the record to considering, um, that they do support uh, the merger. I'm not sure and that's right. So well, I, well I, I, we may beg to differ, but I think um, there has been discussion. Certainly, um, I've asked some pointed questions to them in uh, the evidence that has been provided by them. Um, and they have said uh, that subject to some changes which you've committed to considering um, in terms of the role that they play, uh, they see this as a good thing for student outcomes. I can talk about um, this, the student representative from the University of South Australia who is on record as as, as being in favour of what, what's been progressed and, and was a voting member of council when the, when the decision was pro progressed. Um, I have, of course, uh, met with students. Uh, uh, we have not had um, any um, outrageous student activities as a consequence of this. Uh, it would be fair to say that uh, early in my tenure, there were lots of uh, demonstrations about what a terrible person I was and uh, could I please go home to where I came from. Uh, that hasn't happened as a consequence of this. Thank you. I would John Gardner, member for Moralta. Thank you. Um, I was just to finish off the questions uh, on the substantive run, which was in relation to infrastructure. Um, can I ask, in relation to, I've heard Professor Lloyd talk on a number of occasions, and also Professor Hoy as well, about the use of mixed delivery, uh, particularly the very high quality online model that was developed, well, it wasn't developed for or during COVID, but it was, uh, I think, used much more broadly during COVID. Um, some of the feedback I've had from students does talk about concerns with uh, all lectures in certain subjects being delivered online and therefore that having an impact on the student experience. Um, I'm wondering whether the, in the design of whether either infrastructure or the course design you're talking about, are you able to give us some reassurance that there is going to be a suitable level of in-person engagement available to students doing different courses or is... Uh, a heavy online component, uh, a design feature, not just a, a, a circumstance. So the design um, philosophy is about flexibility, whether it's in face or whether it's online. The curriculum has been create, constructed in a way to allow it to be delivered in either modality. In terms of student experience, I can tell you that the NESA online students have a higher student satisfaction level than the students who come into the classroom. Um, and that's because they have a better quality uh, controlled curriculum, which is delivered de novo from 2018. So it's a new contemporary curriculum. When you've got contemporary curriculum, you get satisfied students. We have an opportunity to have the most contemporary curriculum here in, in, in Australia in the, initial, in the delivery of this institution. The bigger issue and the challenge is, is what constitutes a lecture. Right? If it's a, sitting in a lecture theatre or a third lecture theatre with 150 people and where somebody speaks at you, it's the traditional lecture. But uh, typically, 80% of the activities in UniSA are um, didactic and they're small group and they're, they're tutorials, they're engaged, they're face-to-face. -face. Um, we don't really have traditional lectures per se anymore. There's a bit of a hangover that people expect to see this huge big room. That's not the way modern education works. So uh, and we're not going to move from that or depart from that model in, in delivering didactic, uh, engaged, face-to-face -face experiences, which are augmented by really quality online um, uh, core foundational units as well. So um, I, I think uh, some of the feedback that you will get about online learning is informed by the terrible, by necessity, student experience during COVID, where uh, online was the only way in which we could still have young people doing something with purpose, but we actually couldn't do what is an essential counterpart to the online, that is to turn off, not to lectures, to relearn what you already done online, but you use the available time 
for, for smaller group teaching where you actually work with the material. And, and I, I think particularly when you want to increase participation uh, in the 1970s, as I might have said before, I think only in the order of four to five percent of the population could go to university. It was partly because there were not enough places, but today, if you had to learn full time with no flexibility, we would have absolutely no chance of giving access to a higher education for the segments of our population that are falling short at the moment. So indeed, in our universities, we would say that uh, for the full time, every time we have, we say we have one full time equivalent student, they're actually only an average turning up 75% of the time in terms of full load, because many students will have to supplement what they can get in assistance from family and friends by working themselves. So in a sense, online gives that opportunity. And in terms of work, in the old days, when everybody had to turn up to a lecture to take the notes from somebody talking to them, then they could all only get work on a Friday night. Now there might actually be availability of work on a Wednesday. And you can take that because you know you will be able to access the material. So the online component, which is underpinning, but not the exclusive single means through which people gain knowledge, is an important component of flexibility for people who either have to work or who have family or other commitments. That means they actually can't tur turn up on that for that Friday lecture. So it all comes together. What, what we're seeing with online is that the students who engage both in online and in on-campus experience are the students who do the best. Now, is that causative or correlative? That I don't know. It makes sense to me if you, if you do both things, you have a better chance. But uh, these things are not mutually exclusive, but they are enabling. I think um, in previous evidence, I made reference to the point that it, it would be wrong to think of a student as someone who's just left year 12 and come to higher education. Half of the students in South University of South Australia are non-school leavers. They're people in employment, they're people who access education through part-time means. And when we surveyed our students, which we did very deliberately about the ways in which they wanted to learn, there's a really interesting distribution, which is online, face-to-face, -face, big classes, small groups. They want the cake and eat it approach. And what we have to try and do is deliver maximum flexibility. Thank you. Um, actually, going back to the chair's first question, which I thought was an excellent way to start the session, uh, the evidence, I think, strongly underpins an increase in international students. I mean, there was certain increased flexibility from the merger in your finances, uh, certain potential extra access to research grants, but I think that overwhelmingly the most significant uh, budgetary positive of the merger idea is the idea that you'll be able to have an increased number of international students um, if you have anything like the percentage that Adelaide University currently has across the merged institution that's an uplift of 8,000 as I recall and or, or perhaps even even more than that I don't think you're seeking to have it that high so the, the chair I, I guess invited counterfactuals with his opening questions so I'm wondering whether Adelaide University is capable of increasing uh, its number of international students by that number uh, of that six to eight thousand figure uh, or five thousand uh, without the merger. Is that is that possible? And if not, why not? So when you talk about Adelaide University, do you Sorry, not talk the about University, University of Adelaide? Adelaide. Okay, the, the the unmerged University of Adelaide. We we believe that the student experience that has been talked about at some large universities uh, it has not been held by some classes having a disproportionate amount of students uh, from uh, 
external jurisdictions. Um, and we have a sense that where University of Adelaide sits now is a good spot. It gives uh, a vibrant um, uh, student community with different perspectives, uh, but uh, the domestic students uh, are not left wondering whether they are attending an Australian university. So uh, could we put the number up higher? Yes, we could. Um, but that is as a percentage of the whole university body. So you might, you, you might have 40% international students, but it could mean that in some classes you might have only 5%, which then means that other classes are higher. And in our attempt to, to um, de-risk the running of our universities as well, um, and to maintain a good student experience where the presence of international students amplifies it rather than detracts from it, we don't think we can go much higher at University of Adelaide. But if we don't merge, we might have to in order to be able to continue to exist as a university with ambition. Thank you. Uh, and I guess following on from your comments about de-risking is the um, thinking behind the, the, the brains trust in front of us, I guess. Um, what, what are you uh, looking to in terms of uh, spreading the load, having a, a diversity of countries from where we're drawing students so that we're not having uh, too many eggs yeah. in one or two baskets? So uh, we are both active uh, in many emerging uh, markets and we are seeing uh, that the very high uh, reliance on uh, Chinese demand uh, is uh, uh, as a percentage of the students we get is declining. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one reason is that um, uh, the Chinese demand used to be overwhelmingly undergraduate though uh, China is building its own capability to educate undergraduates. So now, of course, there are more undergraduates who want to go to postgraduate. So we're seeing, we're seeing that shift, but then we're seeing emerging economies uh, such as Sri Lanka, uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Vietnam, uh, where we, we, we're getting more students now as their economies grow faster than their ability to supply uh, their, their, their young people with an education. So I think that there will be a time where, where, where you'll see a much greater diversification and less exposure uh, to single market risks. I think it's worth noting that in 2018, when we went through the previous exercise, uh, in the assessment of exposures to markets, UniSA was one of the most diverse um, international cohorts in, in, in the country. T can be about the same. When we looked at it this time around, post-COVID, there's been a bit of a shift, but the complementarity in the two demographies of the institutions is actually quite striking. There is, um, in the combination, it does actually get more diverse. Each of us is slightly overexposed to individual markets right now as a post-COVID post piece, but the combined institution is de-risked by the combination of the two, two cohorts. And do you believe that you'll still be able to market to your existing markets, even when the combined <coughs> university higher ranking theoretically charging greater fees, are you still going to be able to attract the sorts of students that are coming to UniSA at the moment? We do have a plan uh, to engage on that basis and um, we can't really comment on the, 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 the pricing strategies. I, I just have two issues. The first one will be very brief. Uh, it's just to round off a, uh, an issue that's been raised a number of times about whether or not we can trust the um, uh, risk register of the <coughs> proposal uh, for those worst case scenarios. Can I uh, invite uh, you to respond briefly perhaps on under current arrangements how the two institutions uh, prepared for I think what's been described as a black swan event would it be? Uh, are you any better set up under existing arrangements compared to uh, the risks identified under the merger? Um, so first of all, I think uh, um, when I was on leave, 
uh, I was lucky to be on leave. You, you, you had uh, other uh, members representing our universities showing, uh, discussing in camera the risk register, and you will see that uh, I, we couldn't be uh, accused of sugarcoating how we rated it. Uh, there are definitely risks in there. Uh, however, um, often, oftentimes, uh, it's probably better to look at people's track record of managing risks and see whether they were able to do that when you then judge whether you can trust them to do it again. And I don't know about you, but um, when COVID hit and the borders were closed, that, that was monumental for universities. Um, uh, I ran a university uh, which uh, had about $700 million per annum in international fees. And this was unsettling. We managed to get through it. We managed to pivot incredibly fast. Uh, and I think that experience tells me that the resilience in universities uh, is much greater than we're given credit for. So uh, as I said in my opening statement, um, it's not without risk, but I do believe uh, missing this opportunity uh, for South Australia is a greater risk that we all have to reflect on when we make our decisions about what we're going to do. Um, in advancing the risk register, you would have seen that we've got uh, a risk appetite, risk mitigation, and then a risk tolerance in the way in which we approach things. Um, our tolerance for a black swan event would be pretty low. Uh, the likelihood of a black swan event um, is not completely unlikely. It may happen. Um, we're aware of the fact that there won't be a black swan event which would affect this institution in isolation. It would affect the entire higher education system in Australia. What we would have to mitigate against that is the largest sovereign educator in the country. So the resilience of the institution that we're going to construct um, in that circumstance would actually stand us in better stead. Final question, and also for the session, our time is nearly exhausted. Thank you. Um, I think we've got 12 minutes left by my, by my count. So oh, I think we've got a question I, I can get through quickly. Our that we're only going to be an hour, but in any the, case... Uh, <laughs> In relation to previous evidence, uh, Sarah Game asked about regions, and I think you answered that fairly uh, clearly. But there was also, in terms of uh, subject areas that were potentially at risk, uh, in uh, evidence given on notice, the, in relation to languages, you did identify student interest in language courses being quite low, and it's difficult for institutions at the moment to sustain their offering. Uh, questions were also asked about, in addition to languages, about music, performing arts, history, philosophy, classical studies, and other humanities. Um, if those are all at risk in existing institutions to certain extents, greater or lesser extents, what confidence can you give us of the capacity of the new institution? Uh, the answers given on notice sort of stop short of what I'd characterise as giving strong confidence. Maybe you can help us now. Yeah, um, I, in our opening remarks, the, 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 the kind of the the counter-argument, the, the attainment of and sustainability of comprehensiveness is enabled by the creation, by this merger of the creation of the new institution. Uh, by dint of the fact that we have the means to invest in uh, directly supporting areas which are loss-making, to be frank, uh, but are critical to the delivery of broad education in this state. Um, the, the quantum of free cash, as Peter uh, quali uh, qualified earlier on, which the merged institution would deliver allows a sustainable investment in those domains such as classics, performing arts, music, languages, all of which have very small populations and to run them viably in two separate institutions is a challenge. To run them unviably in an emerging institution will be less of a challenge. I wonder whether our witnesses are able to indulge the parliament by remaining for questions until half past the hour. We would understand if you had other existing commitments, which would mean that you would need to depart. Otherwise, we'll proceed on that basis. Mm -hmm. Fine. Yep. Very well. Honourable Reggie Martin. Yeah. Just uh, one question from me. We've heard, obviously, about the state government's position on the uh, new university. 
Um, don't think we've heard too much about the government, the Commonwealth government. Is there any position the federal government has taken with regards to the merger that you're aware of or anything you can, the info you can provide? Yeah, um, in terms of supports, we have been fortunate in the, uh, we did seek very early on uh, an extension of a scheme called the Higher Education Commonwealth Guarantee. And we, we, we pushed very hard to get that because we saw that as de-risking the transition. The federal government have put in place an extension of the Higher Education Commonwealth Guarantee for the entire sector. But I think we have had a significant input to that decision becoming a reality. Um, I do have something which relates to a question which uh, Member Banaras asked as well, which relates to the Accord and is, of course, in the bailiwick of the uh, federal government. Um, there's been some speculation about the Accord process and whether or not we should wait to see what happens. Um, I have a letter which I'm happy to table and provide to the to the um, to the to members. But I'll just read from this. This is from the uh, uh, the Honourable Jason Clare, the Minister for Education, to myself and Peter. And the the really relevant piece here is uh, the ongoing accord process does not present a barrier to actions individual universities may wish to take to further their mission, including the merger of your two universities. I continue to be committed to supporting the progress of the merger as set out in the statement of cooperation. So we have the full backing of the government and the Accord has no reason to, to pause on this. Which, which I think, um, um, if I remember what I, I read in the transcript of uh, Mary O'Kane's uh, uh, testimony, uh, would be consistent with her testimony. Uh, and she's the chair of uh, the panel. And as I think we said on our first uh, uh, encounter here, uh, we have had no reason, uh, uh, when talking to the most senior public officials in Canberra, to uh, fear that the accord would be an impediment uh, to this ambition. Honourable Jean Lee. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just uh, referring back to an article about ranking. I know that there's complexity uh, about getting the ranking um, system sort of like sorted and um, it is a difficult space. However, I just want to point out that um, the article did refer that the University of Melbourne um, was remain Australia's only top 50 university uh, in the, on the index at 37th spot. Um, the University of Melbourne was established in 1853 and the University of Adelaide was established in uh, 1874. Now, um, do you envisage a new merge university uh, would be able to achieve competitiveness as competitive a University of Melbourne? What would it take to reach there? And um, to also address an issue that was raised by one of the witnesses who said that um, reputation is everything when you need to market a university internationally. So how would you um, address issues about uh, rep reputational risks as such, um, you know, based on what I've just asked? Thank you. Um I'm not sure which ranking the, 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 the paper refers to. I mean, there are a number of institutions which are in the top 50, depending on which ranking you look at. It. The University of Sydney is ranked number 19 in QS rankings. And again, longevity and reputation are go hand in hand. Uh, the, the, the Chinese translation for Adelaide University is the same as the University of Adelaide, so the reputation is not going to be impacted in that domain whatsoever. Uh, the way in which we will be progressing this is through uh, the global visibility of the institution. Peter and I are now regular correspondents in the Times Higher Education where we're describing how we're building the new institution. Um, as well as that, the reputational weightings which are afforded are changing in the way in which uh, reputational scores are calculated in rankings. So I don't believe for a second that the new Adelaide University will jump into the top 50 out of the blocks. That's not going to happen. I have every confidence that it'll be in the top 100 within the first five years of its operation. Um, and that it'll be sustainably there. And our investment thereafter is to bring it further up that, 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 pro, uh, that, 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 um, that ranking scheme. It really depends on whether, when you look at it, will the institution move beyond number five in, in Australia to number three in Australia and over what time period? Because those determinations will be an international student who wants to study in Australia will look at the best ranked institutions in that country and our opportunities to be among the very best will already be number five straight out of the box. So um, whether we're number 96 or whether we're number 49 will have less of, a, of, of an impact 
because there won't be four or five institutions between us and the higher ranked institution. And, uh, so, um, obviously, we have to recognise that um, the state of South Australia is somewhat smaller than Victoria. Uh, we have to uh, recognise uh, that um, the uh, universities such as Melbourne, uh, as a consequence, are much larger, and that is part of our argument. For that, but I think one of the very important things for us to not fall in the trap of is to pursue all elements of rankings that give you better rankings when perhaps that lead you astray, as we've seen that the, apart from University of Queensland, the other four top ranked universities in Australia, out of 42 universities, one is ranked number 40 for student experience, that's University of Sydney. One is ranked number 39 for student experience, that's University of Melbourne. One is ranked from memory 38 uh, for student experience, that's UNSW, and 137, that's Monash University. And if you think about students uh, going to university and ending up with a hex debt, which in many cases is $50,000, uh, it would be wrong to be driven by the measures that gives you ranking only if it means you're not doing the right thing by your students. So we want to position ourselves to be very well positioned when the rankings eventually get it right. And they will get it right. Uh, so, so that's one thing. The other thing is we need to position ourselves so we get very good at what is important to this state as opposed to becoming very important, uh, very good just for the sake of being very good. So you can hear I'm from Scandinavia. Uh, I would be really disappointed in Scandinavian research if we're not good at frostbite research. Uh, I wouldn't be so uh, upset if the University of Queensland's research were no good at frostbite research, but I would be upset if they knew nothing about melanoma. So therefore, for us, it is to define with the state what do we want to be really good at. And for me, one of the things we have to be really good at is the energy transition, and we are optimally placed to do that. And that will count one day. Honourable Connie Benares for our final question. Thank you. Apologies for that. Um, thank you for um, tabling the correspondence of um, Professor O'Kane and clarifying once again um, their position uh, with regards to the um, to the review. Um, the other issue which um, I'm going to ask you to clarify and I think is critically important is the evidence of Dr. Russell. Um, and Mr. Reardon um, from Texas, uh, which was, um, as I said, critically important in terms of time frame. Uh, now, whatever the outcome, um, if you are to meet the time frame for the merger and the associated accreditation processes, and regardless of whether you've previously said, you know, March next year could be um, the absolute cutoff, um, I'm just wondering if you could um, impress upon members what the most ideal outcome is, um, and indeed whether that is this year, uh, and whether there's any benefit to be gained from <coughs> benefit or risk to be gained um, from dragging this process out to next year. Um, we've uh, we've been on record um, basically saying that legislation can't come quickly enough for us. Um, everything cascades from legislation. The, the determination of this committee, the determination of the Parliament, will be whether or not to support the passage of legislation. Uh, the passage of the legislation will, uh, will enable us to engage, to, to have a registered um, university, and to take that university to market in July, and no later than July of next year, to be able to enrol students who will start in 2026. We don't hit that marketing point, which means the university needs to have registration and a brand and systems and offerings and know what it's about. By mid-year next year, the institution will not open on the 1st of January 2026. And we don't, as I said before, have the luxury of delaying it by a couple of weeks. It won't open for at least six months thereafter because it will be mid-year intake. 
the impact of that uh, would be calamitous to our staff, uh, to the, I guess, to the financial viability of the model that's in place, but particularly the signal that it would send uh, to two autonomous institutions who have decided that this is in the interests of both their organisations and uh, the only re requirement is the passage of legislation to enable it. The signal that I would send uh, nationally about higher education in South Australia uh, would be quite um, retrograde as well. But uh, to, to sh the short answer to your question is that um, ideally we would see legislation in the end by the end of this year because we all know that uh, it's a very, very busy period coming up to Christmas and January is a, is a period when a lot of people are on leave. And uh, to lose the opportunity to progress the very, very long list of things that we need to do post-legislation, post-proclamation and pre-registration, um, we, we, we have no time to spare. And uh, there's a further de-risking in that. Um, naturally, uh, staff who are asked to do a lot in preparation for something that might be happen, happening as opposed to being asked to do something for something that is happening is very different. So if if staff are left wondering whether mm, should I really engage really, really hard in revising the curricula to become more modernised and fit for a modern university, they might, they might think, I really want to do that because I know it's going to happen. But if we don't have that decision soon, I do believe that um, uh, the pace at which we progress to the end state, uh, everything else will be slower, and that's not in the state's interest. Thank you, professors, for your assistance to the committee. It is appreciated. We'll turn to a deliberative.